Okay, uh, let's get started if you're both comfortable with that. Um, so welcome everyone. Thank you for logging on uh, to this afternoon's program. My name is Matt Schumann. I am on the programming team here at Cary Library. Before we begin, just a few things to note. Please let me know in the chat if you're having any technical issues and I can try to resolve them for you. Um, and if you have any questions for the speakers, please use the Q&A button. This program is made possible by the generous donors to the Cary Library Foundation. I'd like to now introduce Ashley Rooney, the past president of the Lexington Field and Garden Club. Uh, Ashley has been the host of our gardening series for the past year and a half and has brought innumerable gardening experts to the library to answer all of our gardening questions. So now, welcome, Ashley. Thank you, Matt. And we have an interesting new expert today, Megan Aurora. She's a mutatologist at MGH. She's been in Lexington only three years and somebody told me about her garden and that I should meet her. So I went over and it was amazing. And she has, she's married to a Peruvian. So she has some really interesting stuff in, in, in addition to a regular gardening that you're used to. And I found her fascinating to talk to. She also says we can interrupt. So feel free, I will field your questions, put them right in the Q&A and we'll take it from there. And Megan, you're on, go for it. Great, thank you, Ashley. Let me start sharing my screen. <clears throat> Actually, start at the beginning. All right, so uh, yes, thank, thanks for the introduction. Um, like Ashley said, my name is Megan Aurora. <clears throat> I grew up in uh, Michigan, actually, in the, we do this when we talk about where we're from in Michigan. So I grew up down here. So oh. Michigan, this is the mitten. This is what Michigan looks like. I grew up down here um, in Plymouth, Michigan. And then I went to the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor um, for all my schooling. And that's a growing zone 6A. So it's very similar to here in Lexington. Um, I will preface this talk with uh, the admission that I am, I am not an expert gardener. I am an amateur gardener. I love the, particularly the cottage uh, gardening style, um, but I, yeah, I do have a passion for gardening, that's for sure. And so um, today I just like to kind of take you along where my passion took me, this journey um, to where I am in gardening now and share some of the things that I've learned with all of you. You know, I know that there's probably people on this call who have decades more experience than I do, but I think gardening is all about sharing. And so I'll share with you what I've learned and I'm happy to hear what you've learned as well. And this can be more of a, a discussion rather than a lecture. So with that, I'll, I'll just say that the topic um, for, for my talk is from grandma to Google, how the next generation, so people like me, um, are learning to love gardening. So uh, as our first little kind of gateway into this journey, I just wanted all of us to think, you know, we're all plant people here. So I just wanted you to just take a moment and think back, what are your earliest plant memories? What are your earliest memories of really loving plants? And when did you really start noticing them and maybe asking about the names of them, learning about what they liked and, you know, their seasons when they bloomed, things like that. And, and for me, um, those earliest plant memories were really um, with my grandmother. So this is Jane. She's, um, uh, she has been up in heaven for about, I think, six years now. But my earliest plant memories are with her. And, you know, uh, she, we used to go on walks around her neighborhood. And she would point out to me, um, you know, that's a rhododendron, that's a hollyhock, that's a, she'd give me the names. And I, I still registered those names all the way back then. And uh, she also, whenever she planted her annuals every year, she would give me the extras, which I actually think were just her buying extra flats of impatience and bringing them over to my house and um, helping me plant them in the backyard. And um, I really credit to her a lot of um, the nostalgia and the sentimentality I have with plants to also remembering her um, and kind of living uh, with her through my garden. That's a lovely so, story. Thank you. Good. So um, that's kind of where to start. But this was my very first garden that was my own, um, that wasn't my parents. So this is in Ann Arbor. This is in my little condo. And um, as many of you know, in a condo, um, you're often not allowed to plant into the ground. And I wasn't either. And we had this little, I think it's like 10 by 10 uh, concrete slab that was unfortunately shaded. 
covered. Um, so it was very limited. And this is, I think it was west facing. So again, not a lot of sun. Um, and uh, had a lot of earwigs, a lot of mosquitoes. It was very, very wet back there. A lot of pest problems, uh, but it was mine. And I already had that love of plants. And so I did a lot of just trial and error, just buying things. Um, just if I liked the way it looked, I'd throw it together and hope it worked out. I didn't have a whole lot of knowledge about what different plants liked. I didn't think about west facing, south facing, north facing, anything like that. I didn't think about um, pest resistance. I didn't think about um, you know light needs or soil needs or anything like that. It was just, let's see how it goes which is sometimes just the way to start. Uh, this was a morning glory that I tried to get to climb up that post and it, it had some difficulty, it kept falling down on me. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, several years of living in that house, I think we were there for six years. Um, I finished my training and I uh, got a job out here in Massachusetts and we bought a new home. We lived actually, we rented in Winchester for a year and uh, fell in love with Lexington and decided to move here. Um, and bought this, this um, lovely home. We live on Waltham Street. If you guys ever drive by, if you ever see me out there, free, feel free to say hi. Um, this is what it looked like when we bought it. Um, this is the front yard. You can see there's still a for sale sign there. And I was just so excited to be able to plant in the ground. The very first week we lived there, I ripped a bunch of stuff out nice. and already had like my wheels turning on what I was going to put in. Um, so really let the destruction begin. My time had come, let's make it my own. Um, I had this dream of using this front fence right here and making it look like Nantucket and having these you know, giant hydrangeas flowing over it. And that's really what I wanted. This, you can see there's a chainsaw here. I had some, um, <laughs> I had a um, landscaping company come out and just like cut everything down that looked terrible, You know, trim it up if it looked good, kind of just, tidy at all. Um, in my mind, it had kind of overgrown. I didn't know what was in there. I knew what I wanted. So I was going to take out what I didn't. One major mistake with that, um, that I hope people can learn from is that I should have given it a little bit more time, um, and just figuring out what was already there. Um, I was under the impression that once it was in the ground, that's where it stayed, that transplanting plants wasn't really a thing in my mind yet. Um, and so that's definitely something I learned. There were some uh, plants here that I ripped out. Um, I did transplant these peonies, don't worry, I did do that. Uh, but there were some other things in there that I just threw out. I threw out a rose, I can't believe I did that. Uh, there were just some things that uh, did survive, actually. A uh, clematis popped up the next year. I was like, I think that's a clematis. I'm, if you're that spunky and that, um, What's the word for something that just persists? If you're going to persist that much, I'm going to save you and move you somewhere where I actually want you. So there were some things. Another mistake I made is when we first moved in the very first week, I went out and I bought a bunch of roses because I really wanted roses in my garden. Um, but it was so cloudy that first week we lived here that I didn't know what areas got sun and what areas didn't. So I don't know if you can see here, but this like terribly shaded area that I put a bunch of roses in there. It was just the worst idea ever. And about a week in, I realized like this area is not getting any sun. And I, I moved them all out and I moved them over here. <laughs> so they were only in the ground for a week, but um, yes. So I had plans to kind of, this is all brush that we cut down. Um, I was going to make flower beds here, there and everywhere. I realized that this was like the only part of my yard that got sun um, all the time. And so that's where I was going to plop the roses. And so I did, and it was a tiny little garden at the time. I didn't, you know, it was just brand new, a bunch of perennials, their very first year, um, but I was proud of it. <laughs> and I took lots of pictures and I shared them on social media and I was just very excited about it. And I know that they were small and they weren't, you know, really rooted in or vigorous yet, uh, but I, I got so excited. And then that winter, um, they slept, of course, throughout the winter. And when they came back with vigor, the ones that I had planted, it really started this obsession in me that like, wow, you know, nature can just kind of do its thing. If you put things in the right place, um, it can do its thing. So uh, particularly David Austin roses, I really was obsessed after that first year with them. Hmm. So this is kind of speaking to that winter slump that a lot of us, I think, feel. Um, this was my yard in the winter covered in snow, 
what can I do? I need to see something growing. I need to see something green. I need to feed my soul. Um, so I started planning for the next year and how can I do this when I am, uh, stuck indoors in the cold? Well, I went to the television <laughs> and this is probably the first place I went. One of the first ones I encountered was, um, the BBC's Gardener's World Live. And, uh, this at the time was on Netflix. It's now on Amazon, Amazon prime video. So you can stream it directly from there. Um, and this is where I uh, learned who Monty Don was. So for those of you who don't know, I have um, just a, a little short clip on um, what Gardner's World is and uh, who Monty Don is in, in case it's something that you're interested in. And I just, that's my emoji because I just fell in love here. No. All right. So hopefully you can hear this. The soothing rhythm of nature. The certainty of growing things. It's a kind of faith almost. And I think over the last year of the pandemic, this has been a very powerful. That however difficult things are, there is, a, there is a surety that things will grow and they will flower and they will die. And that's fine. That's okay. That's part of the rhythm. Life endures. It happens. Yeah, yeah. Which is incredibly grounding at a moment when most of us feel like so much is out of control. It's connecting you with with things that feel like they matter. You don't even have to explain why they matter because they just do and they, and they also are real. You can't fake it. Monty Don has been Britain's most famous gardener for decades, hosting BBC Gardener's World for the last two from his home at Long Meadow near the Welsh border. Hello, welcome to Gardener's World. The show now available in America, seeing its highest viewership in 10 years. It's exactly the escape we all needed. That, that pace of life, which is changing all the time, but at its pace, not yours, not the pace of modern life, and the deep rhythm of it that connects the seasons, is spiritually very rewarding. For Monty, a career in gardening sprung from a deep depression after closing his jewelry business with his wife, Sarah. Working in a garden outside really has uh, results that very often pharmaceutical uh, efforts don't. And I think that everybody can improve their well-being, if you like, if not their mental illness. So you can improve your mental health by working in a garden. And my goodness, we all need that. Monty is joined every Friday night in prime time by his two popular co-stars. There's Nellie and Patty. Meanwhile, stuck at home, we had all become gardeners. So I think so I'll, I'll stop that there, but um, just his voice, right? There's just something about his voice that is calming, that is just speaks to me like I think the garden speaks to me that about the the seasons moving at their own pace and that it goes on without you. I don't know if anyone else felt this way, but during the first COVID surge and everything was shutting down, it was almost a shock to me that the the world, that the that nature continued, that spring came. It was like, wait, the flowers know that they can still bloom. You know, all the shops are closed, everything is closed, but the flowers are still growing and the trees are still getting their leaves. It was, there was something just very calm and comforting about that. Um, so what did Monty give me? Well, uh, he gave me uh, just horticultural knowledge. Um, so not only did they talk about kind of the, uh, the mental health spirituality of being in a garden, but there's just a lot of information about plant species. They'd go through particular species that I'd see and I'd be like, oh, I need to get one of those for my garden. And he'd talk about what kind of soil, what kind of sun preferences that plant had. Um, and really to think about the native environment that that plant comes from. So. Uh, one thing in particular was tomatoes are jungle plants. Give them a jungle-like environment, you know, give them that really rich soil, plant them deep, let them grow extra roots. Uh, they need a lot of hot sun. Um, and then Mediterranean plants like lavender and uh, thyme and oregano, those things, put them in poor soil like they would be in the Mediterranean, you know, mimic that natural environment. Um, I learned from him as well. Um, the tools of the trade, so what tools work well in what situations, the lingo, um, you know, annual, perennial, <laughs> um, tender, hardy, even the word horticultural, all these things for somebody who's never been formally taught um, gardening before, you can learn from a show like this. 
Um, and then garden and design, you know, how to put together um, a cohesive thought in your garden, a plan so that it doesn't look so kind of uh, thrown together, but that there's actually some cohesiveness to it. Um, minimizing the number of plants that you're going to put in there and, and just, you know, good garden design techniques um, also got from him. But mostly I think the number one thing I got from that show is this like idea that I can do that. You know, if I can see it, I can mimic it. I can do that too. Um, and that was just priceless for me. Well, we all need that. We Definitely. all need that. Just the motivation, you know, yes. like if, if I can see it, I can mimic it, I can do it. So I went to my local garden center and I filled up my trunk <laughs> and there's a picture of it. Uh, and I ripped out all that brush there after talking with my neighbors, <laughs> making sure they were okay with it. Um, and I put in these stones right here. These were already here, but I mimicked them on the other side. They're just cobblestones and uh, just filled in this area with everything that I wanted. Did you add to the soil? Um, you added compost? I did, yes. Yeah. So you see some lobster compost there. Um, so I did mix in a lot of compost with the soil. Um, and I put in some topsoil, but in general, the soil was pretty good. I didn't have to do a lot to it, but I did mix in some com compost. And then I used Biotone um, starter fertilizer in the bottom of the holes. Uh-huh. And this little tiny fence over there. These little things here? Yeah. Yeah, those are my hollyhock seedlings um, that oh, I, okay. I did those from seeds and I wanted to try and protect them from the bunnies. So I stuck some sticks in the ground and I made these little um, fences with twine, which <laughs> the hollyhocks didn't get eaten. Um, I'm not oh. sure those stick fences did much, but maybe it just slowed them down a little bit. Um, but yeah. the hollyhocks did not get eaten. You said. They did not get eaten. No. Okay. It's better than before. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of bunnies in my yard, let me tell you. So um, in this process, I also, it just, again, it was just feeding my obsession. So I started seeking out more gardening resources. Um, I already talked about Gardener's World from a streaming perspective, but online, I, I found a lot as well. So Rose Reviews is a really great uh, resource. If you just Google Rose Reviews, it now does require a membership. When I first found it, it didn't but it, had, it has a really detailed review on every David Austin rose and how it does in pots, how it does in um, shade versus sun, the size of the blooms, the fragrances, a lot of stuff that you'll find on David Austin's website as well, but um, more in depth and just a little bit more honest uh, because of course, David Austin, um, they don't want to say anything negative about their roses, right? So um, sometimes going to a third party is uh, a good idea to get an honest review. And you can do side-by-side -side comparisons as well. So I really liked, I really liked them. Um, Google has a lot. So anytime I would see anything on Gardener's World, for example, I would just Google that plant and get a more detailed information on um, what kind of situation that plant likes to be in and, and its requirements, uh, its growing zone, those things. Um, and then I've been getting a lot from the Gardening in Lexington Facebook group too, which is how Ashley and I met. Yeah. Uh, so there's a lot on social media just between gardeners. Um, I think there's actually in a week or so, uh, September 11th, uh, there's going to be a plant share as well. So just things like this, uh, having a, a community to garden with is really excellent. Um, so I think they're, they're going to be doing a plant and seed swap, I believe. And people post on the Facebook group, you know, I have this problem. Is this a bug? Is this a fungus? You know, what can I do? How can I treat it? Um, they also just share good things that are happening in their garden, which is always excellent to see. And then some people are, I think once I, um, I was pretty my elderberry bush and I said, I have all these cuttings. Does somebody want them? And a bunch of people came over, picked up some cuttings and I got to meet some Lexington gardeners that way too. So that's a lot of fun. Um, and then I'm going to go through some apps that I use now too, and show you how to use those. Um, and then some streaming resources. So this is, um, a really empowering app called Picture This. It's free. Um, you can download it. This is the little icon um, that appears on your phone when you download it. There are, um, you can pay for a better version of it, but you don't have to pay for the free version. And to me, that's good enough. Um, it's not always accurate, but basically the, the way it works is it goes on your phone, you open the app and you take a picture of a plant. It can be of the flower, the leaf, whatever. 
uh, and it will tell you what plant it thinks it is. It will match it to a database. Um, and it's only been wrong for me a couple of times. We actually used it. And when I went to go visit Ashley's garden, we used it on a plant. We didn't know what it was. And we're like, no, it can't be right. And later on, we found out it was. So um, some, so some, the beef steak, the shisu, I think it's called. Um, there are different, uh, this is very helpful if your garden, you have moved into a new space and you don't know exactly all the plants that are there or say you're just starting to get into gardening and you don't know, is this a weed? Is this something I should pull? Or is this something that was planted here on purpose? I know um, for my neighbor, Bree, um, we bonded a lot over gardening during you know COVID lockdowns. And uh, she was really getting into gardening during uh, the pandemic. And I think this was um, very empowering for her as well, because while there's a lot of green in her garden, it was really hard to tell. And we would go around together and just snap pictures with this app and be like, nope, we can pull that one. Oop, this one stays up, pull that one up. This one stays. Uh, and it really helped us get, you know, for those of us who don't necessarily start with all that, that knowledge or didn't learn it through apprenticeship, um, this is a very useful tool. Does anyone yeah. have questions about this? Picture um, this? Nope, but I'm gonna go put it on because somebody, people are always sending me pictures and saying, can you identify this? Yes, and you can use it through pictures on your phone too. So I've used it at work where some people, they know now they see me on social media posting pictures of my flowers all the time. So they'll ask me things at work like, do you know what this is? I have this tree in my yard. I don't know what it is. And I'm like, mm, I think it's a dogwood, but I'm not really sure. Let's use my app. And then we'll pull it up and be able to answer questions that way too. And it makes you look really smart too. You can be like, oh, that's a, that's a keens or whatever, you know, <laughs> it looks like, you know what every plant guru. is, but you become the gardening guru of work, right? Yeah. 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 And really it's just like with the help of the app. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I've, uh, the app that I use a lot is Instagram. You know, this is a pretty well-known app. But there's this new, uh, I don't know how new it is. It's new for me, uh, phenomena called plant fluencers. You may have heard of influencers on Instagram, but there's plant fluencers. So these are people that kind of dedicate their lives or just have a, a major passion for plants, kind of like me. Yeah, <laughs> but I'm not an influencer, don't get me wrong. But people whose lives revolve around their plants and they are posting constantly um, and a lot of them are indoor plant uh, lovers, but some of them are outdoor plant lovers um, all over the world. I follow a bunch of people in the UK, uh, Klaus Dalby in, uh, where is he in Denmark, I think. Um, but people that are just very knowledgeable and just have really good inspiration for gardens as well. And you start to follow one and then you start to see who they follow and then you can follow them too. And then pretty soon your whole Instagram is filled with beautiful pictures of beautiful gardens, great inspiration, great tips. Um, so one of the people I found that way was Florette. And uh, some of you may already know who Erin is and her company Florette. But look at these like, gorgeous, gorgeous pictures of her garden in, uh, it's on the West Coast, Northern West Coast. It might be around Seattle or Washington or something like that. I, I forget now. Uh, but she's particularly well known for her dahlias, poppies, and zinnia. Um, and so she uh, does a lot of seed production, but she also does a lot of education um, and I'll, I'll go through some of the things. This is her website up here, but you can just Google Florette and, and see a lot of her stuff. She does these mini courses um, online, which are you can sign up for as well. And she'll show you how to do seed starting, how to do um, bulbs. Just They're just short videos um, that they can really get you started as well. So I'm just gonna, uh, this is just a little intro on one of her mini courses. When it comes to flowers, I think it's really easy to think that the purpose is actually the bloom, but it's really that journey with the flowers that is so transformative. My name is Erin Benzacane and welcome to Florette, my flower farm, which is located in Washington's beautiful Skagit Valley. In this course, I'm gonna be teaching you how to take your dream of growing flowers and turn that into reality. We're gonna go through the key steps to planning, how to start seeds, how to prepare your garden space, and then how to tuck your little baby plants in the ground so that they do really well. It doesn't matter if you have a big backyard or just a couple of pots on a patio, you can have success too. The process that we're gonna go through is gonna make it so easy and so fun to do, and I can't wait to welcome you to my garden and have you join me. 
So this is, that was her on um, Magnolia Net Network. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that, but she also has these three beautiful books. The first one I found in anthropology, just when I was shopping for clothes and this was there and it was just so beautiful. It caught my eye. I bought it. It's a nice hardcover book. Um, and it goes through how to do a cut flower garden. She also has a year in flowers and discovering dahlias and her stuff is just so aesthetically pleasing. She's really figured out how to, um, get that aesthetic going and almost in the antique kind of way. Um, I just love her stuff. And then you can also, um, not yet, I think her seeds will be available in January, but she also does really great um, varieties, really specialized varieties of a lot of um, beautiful, beautiful flowers like poppies and zinnia. She doesn't do dahlia anymore, uh, but there's a whole bunch of stuff, um, particularly for cut flowers on mm. her website. Um, if you're looking for very specific varieties, um, check her out. Um, and then she has a, a mini series. It's like four episodes long called Growing Florette, which is really about how she started this business, where she came from in her journey um, to gardening. Uh, it's on um, Amazon Prime, but it's actually on Discovery Plus. So you can get it through Amazon Prime if you don't know how to get Discovery Plus. Um, you can just pay through it for Amazon Prime. I did like a seven day free trial, watched all the episodes in two days and then canceled my trial. <laughs> um, but it was, it was, uh, it kind of brought me to tears a little bit in the middle. It's a very, very, I highly recommend it. Very good show. All right. So, and then the last one I wanted to show you is Garden Answer. So um, I really found her just through Googling and YouTube. Um, so this, her name is Laura. She lives in Western, uh, no, she lives in Eastern Oregon. Um, she's also growing zone six, but she's in high desert. So she has a little bit different climate. She's a lot of wind. It's very dry. She has to run drip to all of her plants, but otherwise she's on the same, she has the same, um, uh, growing season as we do here um, and a lot of the same plants which is really helpful too she puts out a video on youtube so totally free you can get it on youtube every day almost she doesn't do the weekends but every day this is just a screenshot um, she'll go through like her bulb orders tour of her butterfly garden she's putting a hartley botanic greenhouse like her process through that um, the a lot of the lingo comes through there as well um, she's also kind of, I think she's been helpful in a way that Monty Don wasn't helpful for me because she's here in the United States and she uses uh, products that we can find here. She does work with Espoma um, fertilizers and uh, soils and things like that. So um, she does make that very obvious that she'll have, she'll use those products. She also works with proven winners. So she'll mostly be using proven winners plants. So it's not totally unbiased, but those are, again, things you can find here. And so her tips and tricks um, have been more helpful for me. They're a little bit more like instructions rather than just kind of a, a calming, peaceful to like talking about gardening like you get from Gardener's World. Um, she also, I'll, I'll show you in a second. She also has, um, she's, she talks about florette a lot. She uses florette seeds. And then she also uses um, Johnny's seeds, which mm -hmm. I've also um, been turned on to. They have a lot of variety to choose from. A huge, huge warehouse. I think they're out of Maine. Yeah, they and are. they also have the best seed packet information you can find on any seeds. They will go through on their website and on the seed packets themselves. They go through exactly how to make sure that these seeds are successful, which ones can be direct sown, which ones are better started indoors, um, how to treat them. I, I got some verbena, tall verbena from them this year, and it was a complicated seed to germinate. It was like you had to have it on a, a seed or a heat mat during the day, take it off at night. Um, keep it moist, but not moist enough that you can see the soil turn black. And like, it was just very complicated and they had it all written out there for you. Um, highly, highly recommend Johnny Seeds. And um, I had really great germination success with them this year, like 90% on all my seeds that I got from them. You were the second or third speaker who recommended Johnny Seeds. Great, great. And this is, is a- So it's close to us. Yes. And they have, um, they're really, really responsive. So I get my seeds from them really quickly too. Really great shipping time. Um, so this is just one of her videos about cottage gardening. I'm only, it's a little bit long. I'm only going to play, play like a minute of it just so you can get an idea of what kinds of stuff she does.
around. I'm going to kind of manipulate start it back here. You can see I've been watching it this already. video. I want to give you several tips on how to start a cottage style garden. Um, I've got this area right here full of gorgeous plants just kind of laid out how I, I think I want them planted. And I'll go into more detail about each one of these plants here later on in the video. But what I have just quickly is cat mint, a few roses, some beautiful white foxglove, ornamental onion, some pink yarrow, hookera, and then possibly some veronica. And the beautiful thing about cottage gardening is that there's so much freedom in it. There is far fewer rules. Um, there are no two cottage gardens that are the same. They very much so take on the personality of the gardener, which I find very interesting. So now that you kind of see how I have it laid out, I wanna go find a chair and I'm gonna sit down and we'll go over some of the tips um, that I have for you today. Okay, I'm much more comfortable now. I do have 10 tips to share with you and I'll try to go through them quickly so we can get the plants in the ground because that's the most fun part anyway. I do wanna say a quick thank you to Espoma for um, partnering with us on this video. I'm gonna be using a lot of their Biotone starter fertilizer to get these plants in the ground today, which I always use when I'm planting new things and I highly recommend it. So my first tip is to not plant anything in straight lines. When yeah. you do that, it lends to more of a sense of formality in your garden. It looks like you've got like soldiers standing in a row, um, like you're trying to plant a hedge, which I also like formal gardens, but it doesn't work as well for this style. Tip number two is to plant in large groupings instead of planting just one or two of a lot of different things. Instead, we're planting a lot more of the same variety, and that way we can distinguish what is in that flower bed. If you get too many things going Going on, it can tend to look like a jumbled mess and it doesn't give any rest for your eye. Your eye will not know what to land on in that bed. So, you know, in this bed, I'm planting a handful of different varieties, but I'm make, making sure to plant at least three or five um, or seven. And honestly, number doesn't even matter in a cottage garden. I know you've probably heard, you know, you don't need to plant in odd numbers. Well, for your anchor plants, that may be the case, which I'll talk about in a second. But um, when you're planting groupings of things, it doesn't matter if you plant four or five of something, you won't be able to tell in the end. Tip number three is that spacing doesn't matter quite as much in cottage style gardening. Um, so you don't actually want to space your plants as far apart as the tag says, because in cottage gardening, we want everything to marry together and blend together. We want um, one. All right, so you get kind of the idea. I won't go through the whole video. They're all free on YouTube. You can go look them up yourself. If there's a particular plant you're particularly interested as well, like when I was first starting to grow foxglove, um, I found she had a bunch of videos on foxglove. She started from seed and um, you know when to start growing them, when to plant them out, all those kinds of things. And then what her experience was with it, I found that very helpful. She also does some garden tours um, from before the pandemic. Um, but because she's putting out a video every day, it also marries with our garden season as well. So when she's starting to order bulbs, I know I'm supposed to start, you know, me ordering bulbs as well. So I find that helpful too. All right. Hey guys. How Oops. All right. So now those are kind of the resources I've been using. Those are my favorites anyways. <laughs> so for the next, uh, the second half, I'm just going to go through my progress and, you know, my journey with gardening and how I use those resources to really develop uh, our space. So um, this was that kind of first garden along the side that I planted out after it really bloomed out. The first one I showed you uh, with the cobblestones, this is kind of what it looked like. I had some hydrangea along the fence. I had, um, you know, these are daisies, some snapdragons, um, some perennials in there. I planted some milkweed and I was so excited when a monarch landed on my milkweed. Um, Oh, it's not working then. Okay. And as the years have passed, there's really, I've only had three years here, but my plants established themselves. My skills started to improve. This is one of my limelight um, hydrangeas that I cut and brought inside. Nice. Pretty picture. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, this is my first uh, climbing rose that I planted um, in the back. And I think this does a good job of address or of illustrating what I mean by plants really establishing as well. There's the saying with perennials that first they sleep, the next year they creep, and then the last year they leap. And this one truly did. So this is a David Austin Rose called Eden, Eden Climber. Um, and I, oops, I bought it um, as a bare root rose and planted it in the spring. And this is here um, along this trellis. You can see kind of by the markings on the trellis, it was like halfway between the short rung and this higher rung here. And I think it had maybe three blooms that season. <laughs> it wasn't very vigorous. And I was like, man, this is gonna take a while. <laughs> I wanted this huge show the first year, you know, but um, the second year I was kind of like, all right, 
maybe I got 10 blooms off it only bloomed once in the season it got to this top rung it was kind of growing out instead of against the wall like I wanted to um I trim in the in the winter or before the winter I trimmed off some of the ones I didn't want to get broken in the snow when it snowed but then this year it's third year it exploded and that was my um my first slide was of this Eden Rose too it just was going and going and going and I will say um not only is it established and in its third year but I also did fertilize it in the spring too I put some rose tone around it Mm -hmm. um and I think that might've helped too. So this is a picture of it from above too. And you can see, this is like only half the blooms are even open. It was just ridiculously gorgeous. I highly recommend this rose. Now, does it grow all season or does it just have two big, my roses have two big spurts, my climate. Two big spurts. So it's, um, yep, it, it had its normal with all the other roses I have. It had its first flush in June yep. and now it's getting ready to do its second flush now. Um, it's mostly got leaves, but some buds forming right now. Do you put bananas on it? Banana peels? I would like to, but I have a lot of rodents around my house too. They don't like banana peels. They banana don't? Okay. Peels. Maybe I'll try that. I have a lot of squirrels and a lot. I don't think the bunnies could reach it because it's kind of raised a bit, uh, but definitely squirrels would get up there. Oh, and this is another side shot of it. No, that's the one we use for the ad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then these are some of the other pictures I took that first year. Oh, there's a question in the chat. Um, any other resources local to Lexington for newbies? I think um, maybe Ashley, you could answer that question better than I could, but um, I think the Lexington Facebook uh, gardening uh, group is really helpful because they seem to know a lot of resources as well, particular to our area. Right. And I think the other thing, um, if you go over to Bedford, the New England nursery over there, they have people who will really answer your questions. You can come in there with your uh, yeah. bug eaten leaf and say, what do you yes. think this is? Um, that is a really good point that local garden centers are an amazing resource. Yeah, they will definitely show you stuff. We've lost uh, Lexington Gardens. I find Mahoney's is so big. They don't do that same personal thing that New England nurseries. They don't. Does. They're hit and miss. You can find some people who really know their stuff, but there's just a lot of people there who are just kind of watering and yeah, um, don't they, really know, you know, if you find the right them. person. Uh, McHugh's is very good. Um, yes. Yeah. I find no, good. They're excellent. Um, I get a lot of my plants from Weston Garden or Weston Nurseries as well. Um, they have a location in Chelmsford and Hopkinton. And I like them because you can actually go online to their website and look at their inventory. So if there's a particular plant you want, you know if they've ordered it and if it's in stock. No, no, that's which is the point. I didn't excellent. know that. That's excellent. Yeah. Yep. Like I have this plant um, that has amazing fall color that wasn't out yet because it's not fall yet. Um, called Legend of the Fall Bottle Brush. And I wanted it desperately after seeing it on uh, garden answer. I saw it on there and I was like, I need that plant. Um, so I started calling around and looking for it and they, they had ordered it at Weston nurseries. And so then I just called them up and said, I want one of those when it comes in and they set it aside for me. And I went and picked it up when it was ready. And so they actually contacted you that they had it. They contacted me when they had it. Yep. Oh, that's good service. That's very good. Yeah. I would definitely yeah. recommend that one then. Yeah. Yeah. They have a lot of really mature trees too. If you're looking to put in a, a big tree, um, they have a lot of those as well. Um, oh, and then so this hollyhock here, uh, again, reminding me of my grandmother, we used to make dolls out of the, I don't know if ever, if you guys knew that you can make dolls out of the hollyhock um, blooms, just Google how to do it. But you use one of them as the the dress and a, and a bud as the head. And oh. my grandmother and I used to do the, so hollyhocks remind me of her. Cute. Um, this is also my grandmother's handwriting right here. Um, you can buy these rocks where you can uh, you can have someone's handwriting, it, um, what do you call it, engraved on a rock. And she always would say, enjoy. Um, she always hoped that we would enjoy everything. She would sign her letters, sign her cards from grandma, enjoy. And I still have one of those letters and I sent it off to this company that will, um, in, uh, what do you call it, engrave uh, rocks for you. And I, I sent this to some of my um my family members for Mother's Day as well. Um, and then uh, Tulip Angelique is a beautiful double bloom uh, tulip that looks like peonies. Everyone kept messaging me, where did, why are your peonies blooming already? I'm not peonies, they're, they're tulips actually. 
strawberries. Um, and then I can't do this talk without say, talking about my garden helpers as well. This is my son and my daughter, Tommy and Lucy. Um, they like to help in the garden. They like to dig holes, <laughs> find worms, things like that. Um, yeah, they're, they're more work totally than they are help, them. but it's I'm worth it. Question. Tell the audience what Tommy said about plants and poisonous plants. Oh yeah. So my son, um, he picks up on things that you don't think he's going to pick up on. Uh, but we went, I went and I bought some monk's hood the other day and planted it. Um, and he helped me dig the holes for it. And he's like, but mama, the bunnies are going to eat it. I said, no, Tommy, it's a poisonous plant. The bunnies won't eat poisonous plants. And he's like, oh, that's smart. We should only buy poisonous plants from now on mama. So we have a lot of foxglove and a lot of things that the bunnies won't eat. And he, he thinks about these things. He loves weeding. Um, I've taught him to ask me if it's a weed first before he pulls it. Cause sometimes my seedlings look like weeds, uh, but he loves like yanking those and he talks to the weeds and he's like, I got your weed. I got you. <laughs> it's great. It's good fun. Uh, here's some more pictures of them with plants. They have their own, um, they have their own little gardens on the deck as well, where they have strawberry plants and mint plants. My daughter will grab a handful of her mint plant and just shove it in her mouth. She loves that. Um, so starting their love of gardening early too. This poor peony, she could barely walk <laughs> when she did this and she grabbed it to smell it. And then she fell over <laughs> and like pulled it with her. Uh, but it survived, it, it survived the fall. Um, here's some lupin. Um, and this is one of my Litch, uh, my David Austin roses, Litchfield angel. This is all in the first year. This is called a campfire rose, um, which is really cool. It's a landscape rose, so it doesn't need deadheading or anything. Um, but I have it a, in a pot on my porch and this is the same bloom one day apart. And so it changes color like this through, oh, throughout the week, which is very interesting, um, which is, I think why they call it a campfire rose. Um, I'm amazed you can grow the lupin like that. I've never seen them that way. In the that was right after I planted it in the ground. So I, I won't say my lupin is the best performing in my garden. <laughs> um, yeah. Here's some cut flowers from my first year. Um, these are some uh, sweet peas that I did. I didn't do sweet peas this year because they require a lot of, you have to cut them. If you don't cut them every day, um, they stopped flowering um, and it was just too much work for me. <laughs> I didn't do them this year, but they do smell amazing and they're beautiful. And um, I did them in pots. Mm. This is a uh, Litchfield Angel um, David Austin Rose as well. One of my favorites. I just love that peachy apricot center and then they fade to a pure white. They don't have much smell and they have very few thorns too. If you're looking for something that's not very thorny, this is a good one. And they can deal with a little bit of shade too. So like instead of eight hours of sun, they can do four to six. Here's some of my tomatoes the first year. These are San Marzano. We made a lot of sauce out of them. And then my butterfly bush with a monarch on it. Um, these peach Dalmatian and foxglove, which are amazing digitalis because they flower in the first year. You don't have to, they're not biennials. So that's just oh. reward in the first year, which is awesome. And here's that monk's hood. Um, that's the poisonous one that my son was talking about. And what's nice about monk's hood is it's not even a bloom yet. It still comes out later. Yes. This is a picture from last year. So it hasn't, my monk's hood is about to bloom probably in the next two weeks. I think it'll, it's got buds on it anyway. We'll see when it actually comes out. And it's so nice when the rest of the garden is really fading to have that brilliant yep. bloom there. Yep. And that's a good point because every year, we take a look at our gardens and we say, hmm, there's a bunch of green there. There's no color. I should put something in there that's blooming now. And that's how your garden evolves. And, and the way I talk about it with some of my friends is that I think that gardening, the art of gardening, it really is an art. It's like painting with living paints that require specific conditions <laughs> to show their color. So it's a very complicated and they ebb and they flow and your garden's going to change color throughout the season. Um, but it really is like I think it's like, you know, canvas that you're painting on. That's right. As a matter of fact, I noticed my garden starts out pinks and blues in the early mm -hmm. spring, and now is fading back into the pinks and blues with the asters and the monk's hood yep. and all that beginning to come. Yep. It's gone yep. through this yellow, orange, red stage. Okay. Uh, you know, but yep. uh, it's interesting how you could do it. And as long as you can spread it as far, longer 
if you can get those flowers that bloom in the fall, then you can still have, I can put off the dead grays of winter. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, I'll say that 2020, while it was a rough year, um, it really, COVID really let me step up my game in the garden, being at home all the time. Um, it, particularly during the winter, I decided I was going to really get going with seed starting. Seed starting, uh, while it can be very labor intensive, there's a reason those plants cost so much when you buy them as full plants, because a lot of labor went into growing that plant. But if you can do that yourself, you can get large flats of many plants, um, all the same plant and really make an impact in your garden for like five bucks of a seed packet or less. Sometimes seed packets are like a dollar. Um, once you make that initial investment to be able to do the seed starting indoors. So I'll show you how I did that. Um, and then also plant shopping was a great way of getting out of the house in a safe way that was outdoors, yeah. seeing people walking around and feeling a little bit more normal and a family activity for all of us in the house to do. So this is my growing station that I set up in my basement. Initially I had it on my third floor, but I was taking, it was on carpet and I was taking up other people's space. So um, I moved it to the basement and I don't get a lot of light in my basement. I did put it kind of right by one window, but you can see this isn't great light source. So I did have to um, buy some grow lights, which was huge. That it is an investment if you buy good grow lights, but if they're good ones, they should last for a while. Um, I did all my potting in this cardboard box over here. <laughs> I um, put two large buckets underneath. There's one right here. Um, one I filled up with water so I could water them just without having to walk up and down the stairs. Um, I could water them using that bucket. And then another one for all my waste compost. I bought a thermometer that I could follow from my phone. Oh, I have the pictures here. Um, so here's the grow lights. Here's some of the plants that I overwintered, some of my peppers that I overwintered, some of the um, flats that I started. By the time I was done, this entire thing was filled. Um, I left one uh, shelf for all my supplies. These are my two buckets, one with the water and a cup that I would use to water with. And this was my compost. Um, this was some of the, these were my fox gloves that I started from seed. I initially was going to do like 50 or 20 or whatever. I ended up with 72 because I just could not bear throwing any plants away. <laughs> so I kept them all. Um, this was the thermometer I used. It was 10 bucks on Amazon and it was Bluetooth. So it connected to my phone. Um, in the middle of the night, if I was worried it was too cold in my basement, I could look at my phone and it would tell me how cold it was down there. Um, and then I got a, a grow, um, the grow lights. I put those on a timer so that they would automatically turn on and off um, at, in the morning and at night, also bought on Amazon. And then I got a space heater off of Craigslist um, that would automatically turn on if the temperature in the basement got below 65 as well and blow hot air at my plants. Um, the other thing people recommend, which I did not do, is um, having a fan blow on them as well, like a rotating fan to help strengthen the seedlings as well. Because when you grow them indoors, there's no wind. They don't have to be, they can get really leggy and, and not very strong, but if you have a fan blowing on them, it mimics how they'd be outside a little bit better and they're just a little bit stronger. Um, my space heater was a little bit of a wind, but not much. Oh, you're muted, Ashley, I can't hear you. No, that's an interesting point. I've never had anybody say that before to have the um, fan there down there too. Yeah. You're right, um, our things have become too spindly at times. Yes. Um, so garden answer, Laura is the one who she used to have a plant room <laughs> and now she's moved out to a, um, a studio that they turned a barn into a studio where she does all her seeds starting there. Um, and I just mimic a lot of what she does and she has fans blowing on all her seedlings. And it's particularly important for her too, because she lives in such a windy environment. Um, like I'm talking 70 mile an hour winds where she oh, is. So yeah. her plants need to be strong. And they need to be very strong. We have a question. Do you know what is the difference between Osmocoat, time release fertilizer, and Biotone? Can you use both? What was the first one? Osmocoat. Oh, okay. I yeah. don't know Osmocoat. Okay. Um, I don't know anything about it. I Biotone is also a time release. It's um it's slow release. So I don't really measure it when I put it in the bottom of a hole when I plant. I use it when I plant um, perennials. I just throw some in, make, like scratch it in with my fingers and then plant the plant in because I'm not really worried about it burning the plant since it is slow release like that. It's And it's got some mycorrhiza fungus in there as well um, to help really the roots establish. It's a fungus that roots really need to um, help guide them out into the soil. So getting some of that on there as well is important. 
Hmm. If they I don't have any experience with the I, first one. Yeah. They're both time release fertilizers. Sounds like it's, you're doing double duty there. Biotone is what the garden club uses in planting for the pot sale. Yeah. Biotone you can find pretty much everywhere. It's, it's very, um, widely used. Okay. Um, and then there are for starting seeds, you can buy these systems, these grow light systems and everything. Um, but this is Erin from Florette and she, um, she just bought one of these things from Home Depot. You know, these are the things you put out in your garage that you store stuff on. Um, and it was way cheaper. So I went out and I did what she did. <laughs> um, and I just bought one of these for, I think like 60 bucks. And then I attached the grow lights. You can put them on like a pulley system if you need to move them up and down, or you can just, I use zip ties and just zip tied them. Um, and she also did the bucket with the water to, um, water her plants that way too. And she did a space heater because hers was out in a barn. Hmm. Uh, but I got my idea from her. Yeah. Very good. I think yeah. you might do a whole program on growing your plants down there though. Yeah, yeah, probably. Um, and then uh, this is just something else you can do during the winter time. This is for Scythia. If you cut the branches, I think I did this in February, you can cut the branches and just stick them in some warm water and um, put a couple of drops of bleach in the water and they will bloom indoors for you. Um, and so this is a time, this is like a few days apart for each one. And in the middle of the winter, blooms like this are so welcome. You just need some color in your house. And, um, it's just this bang. It, you know, a lot of people have forsythia in their garden. You can just, you know, cut some branches off, bring them indoors. And they last a, like a week or two indoors. This is my daughter trying to smell some of them. Um, and it just brings this happiness and this lightness indoors when everything else outside is still covered in snow. <laughs> you can also do that with dogwood, Yep. Uh, crab apple, all sorts of things. Just yep. put it in yep. the sun. I do it. Um, and it's lovely. It's, yes. Forsythia is particularly it, but... easy, but there yeah. are a lot of um, spring blooming branches that you can force like this. Yep. I, I have never done the bleach, which is interesting that you do. the. Bleach. It just helps keep the, the scum down. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah if you want to get rid of the scum. And what is this? A helibore? Yeah. This is a hellebore, yeah. And this is one of my spring pots that I did with inspiration from Garden Answer. Um, they did one very similar, and so I tried it myself. So I'm just gonna go through um, kind of the season of 2021. Um, yeah, 2020 and 2021 for me, for you guys and show you what I've got. Um, this, these were my seedlings when I brought them outdoors, when it was still like, there were a couple of nights where it would go below freezing. So I kept them in, um, some, some plants like foxglove prefer to grow in, in colder temperatures once they've germinated. So I brought them out there. These are some um, tulips that I had in pots as well. And I just put them in this little greenhouse that I bought off Amazon. Um, one night it got very cold and I was worried about them and I couldn't bring them all indoors. So we put some boiling water in a Home Depot bucket and set that in there with them. And it really like steamed up the place and kept um, it warm inside the little greenhouse too. Clever. Um, and then I bought a cold frame too, and put my foxglove in here. This is all the foxglove I grew, <laughs> not actually all of it. This is half the foxglove I grew this year. And cause I really wanted to fill up my backyard with purple blooms. That's amazing. You, you got that <laughs> plants. <laughs> um, snowdrops early in the year. These are usually kind of the first flowering. Um, one of my friends said that he thought they looked like they were dead because they were all like this. And I was like, no, that's what they're supposed to look like. I think they're so pretty and dainty. Um, but anyway, um, hellebore, these were all, uh, in my garden before I moved in. Uh, I bought a potted peach tree this year. So this is a dwarf peach and I bought it again with inspiration from garden answer. She showed, uh, Laura showed us how to, um, pot up miniature peach tree. And I looked at hers and I was like, I need one of those. So I drove to, um, Mahoney's and then I found it at Weston nurseries. Actually, they had dwarf peach trees there. Um, try and get one that's on the tag. It says it's good for patios and pots because there are dwarf peach trees that can still get to be like 14 feet tall, which is not what I wanted. I wanted one that was going to be like four to six feet tall. Um, so that's what this is. Put it in a pot. You have to get a pot that, um, that you can move easily because mine's on my porch. I have to be able to bring it into the garage in the winter. Um, if you're going to leave it outdoors, uh, you really want if to find something that can 
withstand growing zones to growing zones lower than yours. So um, we're in a six. So I would have to have one that can deal with a four and there's not many of those. So um, I'm going to be bringing this in the garage in the winter. Um, my husband is going to be bringing this into the garage in the winter, yeah, um, but I loved the really hot pink blooms on it. I bought it for the blooms. And if I get some peaches on it, great. It does have, I'll show you um, later. I do have some peaches, although they're not ripe yet. This is Pink Dawn Viburnum. Uh, and I found this one on, on um, Gardener's World. Uh, it's got an amazing smell. It smells like a lilac. It blooms really early in the season. Uh, before anything else has bloomed right around the time of the snowdrops, And then in the fall, the leaves turn this mahogany, gorgeous burgundy color. Mm. Uh, I love this plant. Very pretty. All right. So back to my growing station, I had started some seedlings on a heat mat that are Peruvian peppers. I'm growing them for my husband because it's a pepper you can't find here um, in the grocery stores, but I found the seedlings or the seeds, I should say, and I got them to germinate. Uh, but then they were looking not so great. You can say they're kind of yellowed here, scraggly. They were not happy. I was very sad. I was like, these peppers have got to survive. What it ended up being was fungus gnats. So initially I saw these little tiny gnats flying around my plants and I thought that they were fruit flies. And I was like, fruit flies, what are they going to do? No big deal. Maybe they'll pollinate my <laughs> pepper plants and I'll have more peppers or something. <laughs> so I let them go. Uh, huge mistake. They got out of control. Um, and I tried to buy those sticky mats that, you know, they can, they get stuck on them and keep them controlled that way. But there was too many. And um, I actually would like dig away the soil a little bit and I could see their larva wiggling around in the soil and they live in the top two inches of the soil and eat the roots of your plants and they were killing my peppers so i went online i went on google to try and figure out what i can do for them and they recommended hydrogen peroxide soaks which i tried i was like won't that kill my plant if i soak it and hot uh, like really drench it in hydrogen peroxide it didn't kill my plant but it didn't kill the bugs either <laughs> um so ultimately i unpotted my plants. I washed the roots in the sink and I repotted them in new soil and that did take care of them, but they, the plants were not happy. They lost a lot of their leaves. Um, they did rebound and I'll show you in the next picture. And ultimately some of the other plants, which I did not repot ended up getting fungus gnats, which I ended up getting completely rid of using nematodes. So I highly recommend using nematodes if you have a fungus gnat problem. You can buy them on Amazon. They come shipped to you. Um, this is the brand I use, Scan Mass Biologic. They come shipped to you refrigerated. They come like on an ice pack. You have to put them in the refrigerator immediately once you receive them. And then a package of 5 million will be about four gallons worth of nematodes. And you can um, just... Uh, you know, water your plants as you would typically and just drench the soil with these nematodes and they will go to work eating away at the larva and eating all the eggs of the fungus gnats. And the cool part is too, is this is nature's way of getting rid of fungus gnats, right? Like the, these are their natural predators. So when they um, start to establish themselves in your pots, they keep working. So even though like you killed them off one go, the nematodes are still living in your pot. And if um, the next generation of fungus gnats hatch, uh, the fung the nematodes will eat them as well. And so I've pretty much eliminated fungus gnats in all my pots by using nematodes twice. Highly recommend them. Um, and then this is the pepper plants rebounded. They forgave me for washing their roots and they even had little, um, even before I brought them outside, they had little buds on them, Ish. purple flowers. Um, so spring really got into full swing and these are some columbine I bought, some anemones that I had planted last fall and of course the azaleas flowering. Um, my little garden helpers helped me pull out the hydrangeas that my husband had moved the previous fall to a, a shadier location. Um, and I use this um, location really as a sun garden now and I wanted a, a cottage garden and I planted it up and this is what it looked like shortly after planting. I put in some annuals to fill in some spaces. These are some um, snapdragons I did by seed, um, annual petunias, supertunia, limoncello that I bought from garden center, some white um, delphinium, cat mint, cat, uh, cat's pajamas, 
and some uh, salvias as well. There's some roses back here that I ordered from David Austin that are, uh, what are they, Desdemona. And um, this stick is showing you where I put some dahlia tubers in the ground too. I did some sunflower seedlings by Seed Direct Seeded back there as well, which have now gone over. They're in my background. You can see here's one of them right here. I'll show you all those pictures too. Um, my Guernsey cream clematis really went into its own this year. This is its second year. It's just glowing. And even at night, you can see it from my window. It's highly recommend this clematis. It's a group two. So it blooms kind of late spring. Um, it's still really new. So I haven't pruned it back yet, but I just, I love, I love the rounded. Most clematis have pointed petals and the Guernsey cream has this rounded, beautiful shape to it. No, right next to the forget me nots. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We need to watch. Um, the time. We need to keep going. Oh, okay. Oh, it's two o'clock. I'm gonna just zoom through and stop talking and just show you pictures. Here we go. This is my side garden. Iris, Iris, Lupin, oh, Poppy. Um, this is my patio. I do everything in pots. All my vegetables are up here to keep away from the critters. Uh, my summer rose garden. So this is some salvia. This is Litchfield Angel, um, Queen of Sweden. Uh, this was a beautiful um, uh, delphinium that I put in there the previous year. Uh, Litchfield Angel, Litchfield Angel in Queen of Sweden. Oh, your roses uh, are gorgeous. Alongside the delphinium. This is its second bloom, the Rose Garden's second flush this year. This is my neighbor's um, mini meadow she did. So she seeded this. She just uh, free seeded it in fall or actually in winter. Um, and then it came up this spring. It started as white with little pops of color throughout it with baby's breath and, and bachelor's buttons. And then the poppies came through and it's just been gorgeous, lovely to look at. Um, lots of comments from people as they walk by. Here's my Peruvian Rocoto pepper progress. So I did get some uh, rust, some fungal spots on it. I've been picking those off and trying to spray for it. But here they are when they turn green and then they do turn red. Uh, and we've made some Uchakuta and some just uh, Peruvian uh, pastes with it and done some cooking. It's been lovely. My peach tree, um, this is it all leafed out and here are some peaches on it. They're small. Um, I've, I've uh, thinned it a bit. We'll see if they ripen or not. Um, my front garden, my snapdragons came through, pro cut white night sunflowers. Here's my son with the snapdragons when I cut them. My hollyhocks. Um, side garden with some butterfly bush. These are those pro cut white night sunflowers as well. I like them because they have a really pale yellow and a dark center. Um, they're all gone over now and I've cut them back, given the seeds to the birds. My dahlia are coming through now. This is a great way to, way to get color in the late summer and fall. Right. Um, my cut flowers is my daughter with some of my cut flower arrangements. Here's some zinnia coming through. And that's the end. So more to come. I really want one of these moon gates in my backyard one day. This is like <laughs> dream of mine is to build one of these. This is at somebody in someone else's garden at an estate. And I'm like, Peter, we have got to get one of these in our backyard one day. So that's our, that's our goals, garden goals. Oh, and that's all I have. Megan, that's gorgeous. Absolutely. Thank you. Gorgeous. Your grandmother certainly inspired you to do a beautiful garden. Absolutely. I'd love to come over and see it next spring and see where everything is. You're welcome. And any, anyone is welcome as well. I, I love having people come over and, um, you know, share seedlings, share cuttings, whatever. Um, just talk gardening. Could do it all day. Yes, I can sell that. <laughs> Mary Jones says, thank you, everybody. Fantastic presentation. It was. It was just beautiful. Also, I think all the uh, hints for the apps and programs that one can learn from that's great too. Um, Excellent. There's something that you can take away here. Uh, there will be a link. Um, it will be out as a YouTube uh, very soon through the library. So you can tell your friends and they can go review it and get it from there. Because you gave a lot of names of the roses and so forth. I should point out the yes. uh, Garden Club is having a major rose presentation uh, in about two weeks, but it's gonna be on Zoom. So if anybody wants, you'd have to write the Garden Club to find out how to get on that. Um, but I thank you. Um, you're great. 
Thank you. I had to dream all winter, and I'm going to go look up Weston Gardens in Chelmsford. I had no idea it was mm -hmm. just in Chelmsford. Yep, they're on their website. It will say plant availability. Just click on that link, and uh, it'll take you to their stock. Yeah, they all should give you a present. Um, thanks so much, Megan. All right, take care. Bye, everybody.